Facebook.com and on Facebook and elsewhere. Uh, November marks Native American Heritage Month, and that's certainly a time to recognize the contribution of the first Americans. And that is uh, what's prompted this uh, face, or I'm sorry, this live chat here with four Native Americans from the Cleveland area. I'm gonna give a very brief introduction and I'll have them talk a bit about uh, their heritage. Uh, first with us is Nancy Kelsey. Her current title is Communications and Community Relations Director for the Mental Health Addiction and Recovery Services in Lorain County. We also have Jess, and please correct me on the pronunciation, Vallejo, close, got it, get your, yes, unmute, everybody can unmute. If you can hear me, I see you all have mute buttons, thank you. Uh, we have Cynthia Connolly, Director of Programming for the City Club of Cleveland, and Joe Connolly, an aerospace engineer at NASA Glenn Research Center. And I think, Nancy, let's just jump right in with you to tell us a little bit about your Native American heritage and uh, how that links here to, to uh, Northeast Ohio. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I um, am Anishinaabe, um, specifically from the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians in Michigan. Um, I am a born and raised Clevelander and uh, happy to be back home and uh, happy to be part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Jess, tell us a little bit about your background. Yes, happy to be here. Thank you. I am Yaume, that is commonly referred to as Yaki. In the Southwest, we have a, a group and reservation both on the side here in the United States and in Mexico, we are recognized. And also Diné, that is commonly referred to and known as Navajo on one side of our family. And on both sides, we're also Mexica, Mexican-American, who are you know, descendants of the displaced border. Um, originally, my family is from the borderlands in San Antonio, Texas, but I grew up here in Northern Ohio in Toledo and I'm a transplant now for about 10 years in Cleveland. I own a business and I'm a massage therapist and a doula um, here in Cleveland named Sacred Spaces 216. So I'm thinking. Um, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I did fail to give your, your professional background on the introduction because I was so worried about pronouncing your name right. So thank you for adding that. <laughs> Uh, uh, Joe, tell us about your heritage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Haudenosaunee. We're better known as the Iroquois, but we call ourselves the, the Haudenosaunee. That basically means people of the longhouse, where we hold most of our ceremonies. Uh, the Haudenosaunee is a confederacy of six different nations. Out of those six different nations, I'm Onondaga and of the Wolf Clan. And belong to the Six Nations of the Grand River, which is a reservation in Ontario. But I grew up and was raised in Niagara Falls, New York. I got the opportunity to attend uh, the Ohio State University, and I've been in Ohio ever since college. I got a, a great opportunity to come work uh, at the NASA Glenn Research Center. I've been living in Cleveland ever since. Well, the Ohio, the Ohio State, of course, has a great engineering program. So uh, obviously you landed uh, in the right spot there. Um, and we'll get back to Ohio State University in a moment on one of the topics that's coming up this week on the Turning Point. Uh, Cynthia, tell us about your background. Hello, my name is uh, Cynthia Connolly. My Anishinaabe name is Blue Jay Woman. I am a citizen of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians located in northern Michigan, and I'm from the Crane Clan. Um, I uh, moved to Cleveland in 2007, shortly after meeting my husband, Joseph, <laughs> here on the Zoom, um, as I graduated from Michigan, the University of Michigan. So we have that rivalry here. And uh, I grew up in Detroit, spent a lot of time in Northern Michigan as well, where my tribal lands are. Um, I relocated to Cleveland in 2007, been here ever since, and I would like to say I'm a relocator, but this is indigenous, this is Anishinaabe land, so this is my land. So I like to say that I've just moved to another part of my home. Uh, that's great, I appreciate that. And I'm hoping people were, were listening to the language there. Um, it's good to hear it. Let's talk briefly about Northeast Ohio and the Native American uh, community here. I know it's hard to get our hands around numbers. I've seen statistics kind of jump around because it, you know, there's a lot of Native American blood and how it's tracked is of course always been an issue. 
Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, you know, Jess, if you would, would start, if you can just tell us a little bit about, you know, what kind of community you see here, both in terms of, of other Native Americans that you're able to connect with, but also um, how, how there is assimilation or, and how you preserve some of those, uh, those heritages and celebrations. Yes, wow. So um, the community here is very vast and diverse as far as like the histories that we all have and how we arrived here in Cleveland. And I know that, that people talk about diversity being a strength and in our community, in the Native American community, that it is an urban community, that is absolutely one of the strengths that we have and that we have, we've been able to create a community of people from all over the country in different places, different uh, statuses in relation to what you mentioned, um, identity, tribal affiliation. And for me, myself, personally, um, the connections are not disconnected familially, our culture. That is the most important way that we can preserve the history that we're continuing to live that and to preserve that actively with our community and our children. And Lake Erie Native American Council offers that space to be able to preserve those traditions for the community to show up and ask. These are the things that we would like to learn about and that we were able to provide this space for them to learn those things is essential, especially in this urban community, that we are able to connect again with each other and with those traditions in a common space and also find support in that not all of us come from the same places, but that our experiences now living in Cleveland, we do have things in common and that our world is constantly changing and many of our families are multiracial and multi-ethnic. And some of us, we still very much identify with our native traditions and our culture. And this community is very supportive in that also that it is inclusive of all of our folks' descendants and no matter your um, proximity, should I say, to that tribal affiliation, accessibility and community is still offered for everyone. Thank you for that. Nancy, how have you tried to stay connected to uh, indigenous people and in your Native American culture while working at a places like Cleveland City Hall and being very much uh, part of our, our working life here? Yeah, so I think uh, representation is very important. So I don't know about the other folks um, on this panel, but I am often the only Native American person in the room for a lot of conversations that are had. So I have to bring a unique perspective and um, mostly for better than for worse, I have to be an ambassador, so to speak. So I um, try to educate others about my culture um, and the fact that it's a uh, being Native American is such a huge diaspora of people, um, even though there are very pan-Indian or I guess um, uh, across the spectrum, things like powwows and things that are universal to tribes, there are things that do make us different. We're all part of sovereign um, nations. And um, so I, I think for me, the biggest thing is representation. And you mentioned City Hall, that that's one place I, I definitely, um, felt like uh, I was probably one of the only Native American people, probably the only Native American person working in um, Mayor Jackson's office. So it was always, um, I always felt like that was my role. Mm. Uh, Joe, I have to imagine NASA has, you know, great diversity of minds there, but how, how do they rank on diversity among Native Americans? Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, but, uh... I, I would say having a, a native community and growing up in the Western New York area with my family and a number of reservations right in the area. When I first came to Ohio, it was a little bit of a culture shock going to Ohio State and just not having a, a large native community. So uh, I quickly found that one of the most important things is creating that, that native community for me to, to be able to be successful. So it wasn't until I started to become a member of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society that I really found some academic su success in college. And then when I was transitioning to, to NASA, 
uh, I was actually offered a couple of different positions when I was uh, offered a position at NASA. Uh, and one of the drawing factors of the NASA Glenn Research Center was the uh, Native American Employee Resource Group and its strength of, of having a number of different Native employees directly at NASA. So I, I knew that I would be coming from uh, having the ACES chapter at college to a, another Native community, technical community that I could be a part of at, at the NASA Glenn Research Center. And, and that's just been a tremendous resource of, of having community right there, sort of like a, a family away from home. And, and with that, we've been uh, very active in trying to help NASA in recruitment efforts, outreach efforts. Uh, NASA has been involved with a number of different uh, native initiatives across the nation. Uh, one of the, the most fun ones that we've been a part of has been the, the First Nations rocket launch competition that NASA helped sponsor with the Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium, where they bring uh, tribal college students and uh, college students from across the U.S. to compete in a high-powered rocket uh, competition. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, there's definitely been some challenges along the way. We're, we're not a huge population in general and not a huge population at NASA for sure. Uh, but the, the support from leadership and the dedication to allow us to do these outreach activities has been really meaningful to me and helped, uh, helped me in my career and leadership opportunities. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Joe. And I'll definitely pay attention to rocket launch contests and exhibitions because it's still part of my childhood. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia, you've done a lot with uh, the Lean Act, the Lake Erie Native American Council. Um, and so this original question that started this little round robin was that issue of how do you stay connected uh, when you come to a place like Cleveland um, and how have you tried to do that through the council? Yeah, um, that is actually one of the driving factors and it really, you know, is very fulfilling to me to be able to be part of this community and um, make sure that everyone, you know, is connected the same way that I feel that all of our youth and all of our community members feel connected to their people. Um, for me, it was really um, reaching out to local natives and finding, you know, our community and finding those local groups. There was actually several uh, Northeast Ohio Native American organizations that you could get involved in, and the Lake Erie Native American Council was one of them. And so when I moved here, and again, I was very active with Native student groups in, in college, very active with my tribe and my family, my community um, in Michigan. And so that was like the first thing, like Joe, that I did when I came here is like, where's where's the natives at? Where am I? Where are my cousins? Where are my relations? And um, I, you know, I try to be involved and it's part of our culture and our, our one of our teaching is to always give back and to, to, to serve your community, um, listen to your elders, support your youth. And so that's how I actually became involved here in Cleveland was by youth programming, predominantly through the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, the local professional chapter that Joe is part of here, um, as well as through LENAC. So really just wanted to volunteer my time, talent, treasure, all of that, that we all try to do, you know, in our, our spare time. And um, also realizing that that's just um, part of our culture and our ways to make sure that we're always, you know, contributing to the community together. All right, now, uh, thanks for that. Uh, this is a really great setup as we now move into some of the topics. Uh, let's get the, the, the big elephant out of the way, and that's the Cleveland Indians, Chief Wahoo, the name issue. I'm curious for many of you, you can feel free to weigh in, when someone learns or you share that you're Native American, was one of the first questions like, well, what do you think of Chief Wahoo? Does the Indian's name bother you? Why would it? Or do people not bring that up? I, I don't know. Na Nancy, you're smiling there. And then we'll come to Jess. Do you uh, have a reaction to that? Yes, absolutely. So this goes back to when I was little, um, growing up on those small Catholic schools on Cleveland's east side and Slavic Village neighborhood, having those conversations with people. Um, it was very different back then. Um, my how I was approached by it and how I responded to it. Um, today, when people uh, have these conversations with me, I see it as a learning opportunity. Um, a lot of people will ask me what I think, and that will be, to your point, the first question that a lot of people ask. And I think uh, the conversation has become more um, of a dialogue than people trying to convince me that my opinion, um, that the mascot and... Uh, team name should change. Um, so I, I appreciate that people, uh, this has been, I've received more support recently with the name change than I thought I would. I've also received a lot of um, people trying to convince me that uh, it's not a big deal. So, you know, it's, it, 
we've come a long way. There's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. Thank you. And I know, Jess, we've talked before on, on the issue of, of the power of the chief, or I mean, of the chief Wahoo and, and how you've described to me in the past of, of seeing that. And that's like ripping open a wound. Um, how, how have people reacted to you when they learned you're Native American and uh, on the point of the Cleveland Indians baseball team? Well, I think that it is always a topic that people approach with some hesitation, especially with me, because I am very well known to be uh, outspoken about the mascot being a detriment to the psychological um, health and wellness of our community and definitely to the children that are constantly forced to um, see that image. And the wound that I refer to is that it not being allowed to heal is that with the removal and the eradication of the mascot, we are able to exist in our current state as we have um, evolved as people, as our communities have continued to grow and change. And that the removal, and as I've mentioned to you before, the eradication of all of these mascots allows the space for us to now define who we are and tell our own stories and for us to teach our histories, the correct history and allow people to understand like um, Nancy mentioned, there's an education gap. There is a misunderstanding of who we are because our education system does not offer the truth to the masses and our public school systems need to be changed um, for that reason. We need to update our history lesson. And when we can do that, when we can confront the fact that there is no longer uh, a barrier to our identities being valid, I guess. We are defining who we are and there's no longer a competition in that conversation. So when people approach me, it's often with hesitation because they know that they're going to get a piece of education in some way or another that they may not have considered by asking me the question. And it always comes back to me um, to telling people that there's definitely the source of this is our education system. For us to be able to change this in our children's lifetime is to definitely focus on getting the real truth told about history and definitely recognizing the people who are still here. Yeah, that's helpful, Joe. And you, you're, you're not, I mean, you're in a, a very business professional uh, environment every day and NASA is, uh, the, the, the Cleveland Indians ever come up? Uh, it, yeah, it, it definitely does. I, I would say before even working in the business setting, uh, my uncle uh, is an artist and he was uh, attending the University of Illinois with a, a similar mascot, uh, Chief of Line Awake. And uh, with, because of that, we ran in, he ran into issues when he spoke out against the, the mascot at the university he was attending. And the, the local paper published his personal information and his kids' information, and he ended up getting a lot of threats. So before even taking the job here, there was a lot of concerns on my family just because of uh, the mascot in Cleveland and some of our, our family experience when, when traveling to, to cities with these kind of native representations. <clears throat> but, but from there, I, I would say that it does end up being a conversation piece that sort of detracts from some of the, the missions that we're trying to accomplish in terms of getting uh, Native students being more engaged in the STEM fields. Uh, one of the things that I'm also a part of is the American Institute of uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, and we have a local chapter here and the, the organization always goes to a, a baseball game every summer. And it was just something that I couldn't fully participate in uh, in good conscience. Uh, and now I'm the, the chair of that local section, and I'm so excited that I'm a, a chair in this summer. We'll be able to actually be able to participate and go to a Guardians game uh, and participate in our technical side of these social and outreach engagements. So just uh, having this behind us, I think, uh, allows a lot of us in the Native communities to more fully participate in all that Cleveland has to offer. That's great. And I know it's no consolation, but worth noting that, uh, you know, the Indians name controversy continues over the Guardians, uh, though today they did settle with the roller derby team, mm -hmm. that they're both going to coexist and share that name. Um, but isn't it great that the, the controversy has moved on to a to uh, another another aspect and S Cynthia, certainly you've 
both in your professional work and, and uh, outside work, certainly had to come across this, not only from media, but being at former Think Tank Policy Matters, being at the City Club, which is all about open dialogue and mm -hmm. this, how have you dealt with it? Wow. So I think the, the first thing that I point out is that it's always the first thing that comes up when someone meets me and they find out I'm native that it, it like clockwork, uh, you know, how do you feel about the mascot issue? And that's one of the main reasons, like, as, as uh, Jess so eloquently put out why, you know, we find this being severely problematic because a lot of us work in the professional sector. And, and as Joe said, we have a lot of important things we want to get to not only within our own careers in um, our community, but nationally as well. It's been a dominating conversation nationally. Um, and it really starts to over, overturn some of the, the important work that we're doing. Um, I, I think the visibility of our community specifically has been very limited, um, particularly opening day, right? Um, we get we get some we get some uh, attention come Thanksgiving, um, Columbus Day, and then it's like, you know, rinse, repeat, you know, every year. And um, I think when we, we realize, you know, the mascot issue has some like more systemic level um, uh, connections to what's happening in this larger conversation about race and uh, race equity and justice. And when we talk about the limited ways of people, people see us when I uh, give presentations to classrooms, you know, third graders, fifth graders, libraries, you know, senior centers. And the first thing I always ask them is, you know, picture a Native American in your head. You know, what do you see? And, you know, they'll say tomahawks, feathers, teepees, Chief Wahoo. And I said, can anyone name a Native American that is alive today? Just any Native person that is alive today. And crickets, very few times have someone have ever been able to name an actual living Indigenous person. And it's awkward because I just introduced myself to the class and they could, literally could have just said me. <laughs> Um, but that just shows you the bias and how ingrained kind of the imagery that we are and are supposed to be um, to, uh, you know, the general population. And when they see me, that is, it, it's jarring to them because they're not expecting to see, you know, a modern indigenous woman, they're expecting to see feathers and teepees. And when you realize that there's a very limited way in which modern society sees you and views you, that really weighs on you. Um, and there's scientific research that proves that that weighs heavily on our youth to the point where it has very negative impacts on their self-esteem, their feelings of self-worth, their feelings of community, sense of community. So these are all really huge points that we see reflected in our youth here in Cleveland. And that was one of the main driving points why we pushed for this fight for the mascot, because it is just one piece of a very large puzzle of the lack of representation and visibility of our people in 2021. Um, Cynthia, just before you, you know, we move off this topic, educate us and me. I can't name uh, many Native Americans. I know we have a new, uh, you know, Interior Secretary uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, administration of, of Joe Biden, but um, you know, put a few on our radar that we might want to Google and look up if you. Oh could. man! So <laughs> we will first of all, if anyone hasn't checked out, like so, there's some modern TV shows that just came out with written by an entire news like yeah. writing room full of indigenous uh, uh, comedy writers and and screenwriters, and it's 2021, and it's the first time that we've had that happen where we've had a native show written for and by indigenous people, and. It's insane that that's like where the bar was like, wow, we have a show featuring modern native people. Um, we're not set in the 1800s, feathered and leathered. So there's a comedy troupe called the 1491s with really amazing people. You were mentioning uh, the uh, Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. We have Sharice Davids, who's a uh, representative there. Um, we have these amazing women here and, and Joe uh, that are representing here. But there are a lot of really great thought leaders um, on um, social media right now. One of Joe's really good. Um, um, colleagues at NASA but over in California, Aaron Yazzie, he's Navajo, and he has a piece of equipment on Mars right now. Um, everyone calls him like Native Bill Nye. And it's there's some really amazing just movers and shakers in um, Indian country right now that a lot of people just don't realize. I mean, I fangirl over them, of, of course, but um, if you follow me on Twitter at Sin Connolly, I mean, this will show up on your feed. I retweet and share all of this stuff. And that's my recommendation for people is if you want to get into what we're what we're doing now, you know, do an audit of your social media feed. Are you following news at native news outlets? Are you following native thought leaders and influencers? Just follow them and it will show up on your timeline and you will digest that news the same way we digest all of the rest of our news. 
Fantastic. And I think you're referring, correct me uh, if I'm wrong here, on Reservoir Dogs is the name of yes, the, uh, in, the uh, comedy uh, show uh, set on a reservation um, in, in Rutherford time. Falls as well as another one with Ed Helms. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, while I'm looking for another question here, uh, if anybody wanted to weigh in, feel free. But I wanted to get back to Ohio State because one of the topics that we will talk about this week on a turning point is looking at uh, some of the history of Ohio State University, which was, was created uh, in the late 1800s on land that was taken from Native Americans. And there is a professor on campus that is, is looking at, at aspects of reparations. Reparations is a, you know, a big issue that it's often talked about with um, um, you know, African-Americans in, 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 in the history with slavery. Um, but it, it certainly is a big part of what's been going on with Native Americans. You know, the short history lesson, I mean, uh, they got moved off of most of their land in the United States through various treaties that were uh, badly negotiated in favor of the government. Um, and, and that's been a big issue and the issue of reparations. That's a big topic. I don't want to get too deep, but I mean, does that issue come up? Uh, you know, either Nancy or, or Jess, do you guys uh, touch on that stuff? So, um, yeah, yeah, I so for me, this is an issue that hits really close to home in Cleveland. Um, so my uh, family, we grew up uh, over there by where the Opportunity Corridor is now located. So to give you a talk about modern Native American displacement, my family had to move at um, out of our 30 plus year home over there on East 57th and Francis. Um, because we had to be displaced by the government, which is a very common theme for Native Americans. So the irony there is not lost on me. Um, so this is nothing new. I mean, th this is uh, something Native people have had to endure for a long time, and we still have to endure in, uh, in, in different ways. So for me, I think, you know, that that's one issue of a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, bigger issues. Um, as far as displacement, I mean, we see it, we still see it all the time today in the form of um, not recognizing treaty rights. Uh, that happens all over the country now, still today too. And I'm sure that's something that most of the people watching this probably aren't familiar with what our treaty rights are and how that differs from tribe to tribe. And um, what some of the quotes, I'll use my air quotes, benefits that people associate um, with Native Americans. So my tribe and Cynthia's tribe, for example, uh, is located in Michigan. And one thing I had always heard is, wow, you guys can go to these colleges for free in Michigan. Well, no, that's part of a treaty, right? Uh, <laughs> there was land and there was uh, genocide uh, that occurred in the mortgage payment. Payment all that. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there's a misconception that um, there's all these benefits that Native American people get um, that are actually rights that are, um, that the U.S. government was party to agreeing to. So, um, Unfortunately, a lot of those also aren't honored today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jess, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on, on the relocation issue briefly. Yes, absolutely. Um, I actually work in Cleveland. We have a reparations group that was organized. It's called Reparations Now Cleveland. And it was a grassroots organized group um, by local community who really saw the need to um, redistribute and repurpose wealth during the pandemic. Um, so to support black and indigenous families, there was a community resource that was created so that black and indigenous families who needed support during the pandemic and now has continued are able to access funds in the form of reparative justice. And when we talk about reparations, we know I guess in my, what I can offer here to talk about reparations is that we know that reparations is something that we cannot accomplish because we cannot undo what colonization has left us to deal with. And the way that white supremacy and all of the colonial systems are compounded to impact us generally systemically, right? So that this organization and these reparative methods that we choose are offering other ways more than just financial support to community members that are repairing um, their life in ways that gives them dignity and support that the system does not offer black and indigenous families. So reparative justice is something that's really important to me. 
Reparations Now is definitely something that people can get plugged into and support locally. And we do support local people. So know that when you support Reparations Now Cleveland, you're also supporting reparations to these communities locally. Thank you. That's uh, important. I hope people will follow up to take a look at that. I don't know if Joe or Cynthia want to uh, touch on the issue of reparations. I know, again, a big topic, but you all impressed me with having connections to these issues, uh, and, and it's helpful to hear from it briefly, if you could. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll chime you in here. I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, Sorry. I think it's, he's moving. Yeah. The sound wasn't coming. Yeah, um, I, I think it's important for people to stop and reflect, um, you know, the lands in which you're standing on, right? And I, I think in Ohio, it's very easy for people to, even though there are no federally recognized tribes, really refer to and talk about Indigenous people in the past tense. Um, I've overheard a number of conversations where they talk about Native people, um, and it's all in the past tense. And I'm like, oh, what would they do if they found out that like they're standing next to like a whole bunch of Natives like that are alive right now? Um, and it's, I, I think that people just need to stop and reflect of, of whose land they're standing on and realize that it's it's still Indigenous land. This is still our our land. You're in the Great Lakes region, um, so uh, you know this is Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Erie, uh, Miami uh, land. And um, that's really important as well. And, and to really push themselves to do the education they need to, to learn more and really be purposeful about including who we are as a modern people in their in their day-to-day -day lives. I think something like 87% of state history standards in this country fail to talk about Native Americans after the year 1900. And it's, you know, that's how you get like little kids like me going to natural history museums and saying I'm, I'm native like this diorama full of native people and my classmate telling me that you can't be Indian Indians are extinct. Um, so I'm really challenging people to kind of, you know, push the mold, um, start, you know, reflecting on the land you're standing on and also realizing that we're still here today. Uh, that's a great bow to put on this discussion uh, to wrap it up. I appreciate that. I wanna remind viewers or, and people watching that on a special on Thursday, we're gonna to touch on some of these issues, uh, you know, the issue of mascots at high schools still, um, and also looking at relocation, you know, the efforts by government to assist people to move off the reservations and assimilate. Cleveland was one of the, you know, eight or 10 major cities. And I know I've met many Native Americans from Cleveland who came here as part of that program. I think that'll be an interesting Look, um, everything you've offered uh, has really helped us at least advance this conversation, especially especially past the idea that Native Americans just protested uh, Chief Wahoo and the Indians. So thank each of you, you know, Cynthia, Jess, Nancy, and Joe, and sorry for the audio issues. Um, thank you for being a part of this discussion. And I, uh, you know, hope people will watch this, uh, you know, on Thursday and it will live on the web here. Uh, for uh, quite a while. Thank you and, and good night. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> I <laughs> appreciate you. the connection. Yeah. I'm not sure if we're off the air or not, but yeah. No, thank I you for taking the time, all of you, for coming on. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Jess. Bye.